so on the first occasion I was invited to come here and lead the service, one of the things I did is we looked at some of the differences in the, the Lord's Prayer as it's written here on the front of the chapel compared to the one that perhaps many of you know. And uh, it was looking at this again that I thought, let's look at forgiveness. If you look around the middle and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors is the line that's written here. And this is the, the version that I learned as a child. Of course, the word used by many rather than debts is trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. What's the difference between the two? Well, my sense of that is a trespass is always a wrong. We have been wronged in some way. Whereas a debt might include a way that we have been wronged, but it might also include a good that we have performed for another. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, I am forever in your debt. It's talking about something that you have done for me, for which I am grateful. So debts can include both what is wrong and what is right that has been done, the good that we do for one another. When we talk about forgiveness, one of the things that, I, that stands out to me is the world we live in is a world that is ready to be shocked and offended. You think about how common that is today to be shocked and offended. And I think the media plays a great part in this. That the headline, the attention grabbing headline is the one where someone is shocked and offended or one that seeks to make us shocked and offended. I have a news app on my phone. I'm sure many of you do as well. And I often will get up in the morning and just see what's going on in the world. And you can usually tell that everything is going along okay. There have been no big disasters. When my news app does something like, it finds a TikTok video where someone has made some innocuous comment and then there have been streams of comments where people have been offended by what has been said. One of the things that I do in Melbourne is we have a YouTube channel and various other social media things that we, we get involved with these days. And I have an account with a company called vidIQ. And the whole purpose of vidIQ is to help you get your videos noticed. And as I was trialling this membership out, one of the things that I realised was it, it talks about the emotive value of a title. So it tries to evaluate the titles you put on your videos and your shorts to say, you know, whether it's going to grab people's attention. And one of those things is whether you shock and offend people by doing it. It actually gives you a higher score, a higher ranking by producing a title that shocks and offends people. Which is quite an interesting commentary, I think, on our modern society. And I think it runs counter to spiritual principles, the principle of forgiveness. Because as I read the text of the Bible, one of the things that I realise is that to be unforgiving is to be unforgiven. Do you understand what I say? To be unforgiving, to be shocked and offended, is to be unforgiven. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. If you want to do the maths, it's 490. But is that what Jesus is really talking about? He's talking about unending forgiveness. At the end of what David read again, it said, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? This is the king talking to that man who he had forgiven that great debt. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. In the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And then immediately after the Lord's Prayer, the Lord says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Mark's Gospel, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. To be unforgiving is to be unforgiven. The two are very, very clearly tied together. However, if we read the whole of Matthew chapter 18, there's a slightly more nuanced view that we have to bear in mind. Already talked about the little child that Jesus brought into the disciples' midst. So he calls the little child in. And then there is this warning not to be the reason why the child stumbles. So the Lord says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offences, for offences must come but woe to that man by whom the offences come. He goes on to talk about the, his mission in the world. He says, the son of man has come to save that which was lost. He talks about the parable of the lost sheep. And then he talks about this story about the sinning brother. So what I want to say is that there are clearly things which are wrong. There are clearly things which are hurtful which should not be tolerated, should not be tolerated. So how then does that fit in with the idea of forgiveness when Peter then goes to the Lord and says, how many times should I forgive an offending brother? 70 times 7. So I'm just going to read very quickly a, a couple of lines from Swedenborg's teaching, from the teachings of our church, where it says, it is permissible to think about the moral and civil life of another person and to judge it. So we are to look at what someone does and decide whether what they do is right or wrong. That is a useful thing to do. Without such thought and judgment concerning others, no civil society could subsist. If we didn't have a sense of right and wrong in the world we would fall into chaos. You think of think, simple things like uh, which side of the road you, you drive on. In our country, we stay on the left. And if we were to occasionally go across onto the right, it would be chaos, wouldn't it? Very difficult. So we need a sense of what is right and what is wrong. But how are we going to navigate this problem? There is a sense of what we call evil, things which are harmful, which ought not to be done. There's a sense in which we are to judge that action and avoid it and possibly tell others off for it. But on the other hand, we are to forgive. How do we reconcile those two ideas? The insight that Swedenborg brings to this problem is this. He talks about the principle of removing the idea of person when we deal with with an issue like this. So when we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about what someone else is doing, it's very easy to get tangled up with the person standing in front of us. Actually, what we ought to be considering is the principle that is driving them. It is that principle that we are to look at first and foremost. So Swedenborg again writes this, not to judge and not to condemn, signifies not to think evil of the neighbour spiritually understood. That is, to think of his faith and his love, which belong to man's spiritual or inner life. For these lie concealed in his interiors and therefore are unknown to anyone except the Lord alone. So when he talks about judging another person based on their actions, we have to remember we're only judging the action. We're not judging the person. 
We're not condemning the person. We're simply saying what you are doing is wrong. You ought not to do it. But we don't then turn around and say, you are going to hell because we do not know that. So to remember the principle that is driving the action, not the person who is doing it. So here's a a definition of forgiveness which bears that in mind. To forgive is not to regard anyone from evil but from good. In other words, we don't blindly accept what is obviously wrong. If If someone is doing something which is obviously wrong, we are not to accept it. But in dealing with that person and anybody else affected by it, the way in which we act has to be motivated by our concern for their welfare. So when we speak about a perpetrator and we're dealing with a perpetrator, our action, whatever it is, must be motivated by their welfare. When we're dealing with a victim, our action, whatever it is, is to be motivated by their welfare. We shouldn't act out of a sense of offence or a sense of injury of our own pride. We're to act out of love and concern for one another because we know where harmful, evil actions lead. We know the consequences they lead to. And that is to be avoided. When I take this idea of this dealing with the principle and not the person, the other thing I want to say is remembering that we are all, we all have something of the child within us. So when Jesus talks about the, um, the person causing a child to stumble, he's actually talking about us. He's talking about the way that any of us in dealing wrongly with someone else can cause the child within them to stumble, can cause the innocence within them to fail. We are called to deal with the person, no matter how old they are, based upon the innocence that is potentially within them and to help that flourish and grow. That's forgiveness.